Worse, even, this is the HR and equity people, they're actually mucking about with people's unconscious biases. So this is what we want, right? We want your employers and the state to re-educate you so that your perceptions, because that's what we're talking about with regards to unconscious bias, so that your perceptions fall into an accordance with their demands. And not even your voluntary perceptions, by the way. Your, your involuntary, unconscious perceptions have to be retrained. Okay, so maybe that's not so good, especially when you look at that bloody implicit association test. Mazarin Banerjee from Harvard and Anthony Greenwald from the University of Washington. So Banerjee is an avowed Marxist, and Greenwald and Banerjee both bloody well know and have written that their implicit association test has neither the reliability nor the validity to be used as an individual diagnostic test. Could they you, know it. Sorry, just jump in. I, I've lectured about that in my class, but not everyone is aware of that. Do you want to just give it? I can pick, bring up a PowerPoint slide, or do you want to? Yeah, why one? don't you do that? Yeah. Do you want, do you want to do that? Sure. Yeah, no, so I'll let you take over when you do that. So, <laughs> despite the fact that. Oh, sorry, so forget all of them. It'll take a few minutes, so... Uh, yeah, well, despite the... Okay, so the implicit association test, in principle, is this word association game. It's actually predicated, I would say, on psychoanalytic ideas, uh, most particularly on Jungian ideas, because Jung developed the association test many, many, many years ago. But it purports to investigate whether you are unconsciously biased towards one group or against another group. Could be gender, could be ethnicity, could be race, could be attractiveness, whatever. But... The problem is, is that when you give the same person the damn IAT twice, they don't get the same results. So there's a rule for diagnostic tests. And the rule is the reliability, test retest reliability, has to exceed something like 0.8 or 0.9. 0.8 at least. So the big five does that. IQ tests do that. But there's a damn, uh, there's damn few tests that pass that reliability criteria. And the IAT is only reliable. I don't remember precisely, but I think it's about 0.5, which isn't even, it's not even near close enough to be used as a diagnostic test. Plus, it's not valid. So what does that mean? Well, let's say I assess your unconscious bias and give you a diagnosis. Well, there's no evidence that it predicts your behavior. So, so what, is, what good is it? What good is it? Well, it's good if you want people to uh, send you to retraining exercises so that you can have your perceptions adjusted in the direction that your organization and the state thinks is proper. And that's happening everywhere. I got letters this week already from people at CBC. It's becoming mandatory there. St. Mike's Hospital, same thing. And they've decided that all of their micro institutions within the hospital will be equitable. There'll be 50% women and 50% men at every single level of the organization or the organization is corrupt and oppressive. It's like, it's, and that, it's, it's spreading so fast you can't believe it. I wrote Mazarin Benaji and Anthony Greenwald yesterday and sent it off to some of my colleagues saying, are you going to come out and make a public statement about the fact that your damn test is being used by pathological people for nefarious purposes? It's like, well, we'll see what they have to say about that. I was a bit more polite in my letter than that. <laughs> but there's no excuse for it. There's absolutely no excuse for it. And as far as I'm concerned, it's part of the broader corruption of social psychology. You guys may know or may not that social psychology has been rife with, with uh, controversy and scandal over the last three or four years. And a big part of the reason for that is it's damn corrupt discipline. And the use of the IAT for political reasons is a perfect example of that. There is no excuse for it. And the people at St. Mike's, you know, they say, well, this is scientifically validated. It's like, no, it's not. And worse... Let's say you do have unconscious bias, just for the sake of argument, and you could measure it reliably, which you can't, and that it was valid, which it isn't. Let's say all of those things were in case. There's no evidence whatsoever that those damn unconscious bias training programs, retraining programs, have the effect that they're supposed to have, and there's some evidence that they actually have the reverse effect. And maybe that's because people don't really like being marched off to re-education by their employers after they've been diagnosed as racist, even if there's no evidence that they in fact are. So it's an absolute misuse of psychology, and it's, and it's, it's politically motivated. It's politically motivated. It's an assault on freedom. Anyways, 
I made those two videos and I took, tried to take the HR and equity people at U of T to task because they made that training mandatory for their HR people. I thought, you don't have the right as an employer to invade the unconscious structures of your employees' minds and alter their political perspective, even though you can't do it. You don't have the right to do that and to think about it as something you should do as a matter of course, as part of your ethical duty is... <sighs> You really want that? You really want that? That's what you want your employers to be able to do. Hmm? Figure out, independently of your behavior, whether or not you're, like a, you're a racist, or a classist, or, or a misogynist, or whatever that happens to be. And you really think that the bureaucrats at the university, for example, or bureaucrats anywhere for that matter, are actually capable and qualified of doing such a thing properly, without doing far more damage than, than any possible good. Well. So anyways, I made those two videos trying to sort this out and to investigate it. And then, for whatever reason, you know, the proverbial, well, you know what happened. By within two months, there was 180 newspaper articles written about it. And I don't know how many millions of people have watched these things online now, but it's plenty. And so what that also means is I put my finger on something. Because who cares what a dim-witted professor from the University of Toronto does with his spare time at midnight? No one should care. I should have had my 15 minutes of notoriety, if that. But that isn't what happened. It was, it was major news in Canada for three months, and I'm still talking to people all over the world about it. I get a hundred letters a day, at least. I can't keep up with them. About pe from people who are being cornered in all sorts of ways by their idiot employers and these, these safe space propositions at universities and the restrictions on their speech. They, they tell me constantly, well, I really agree with you, but I'm afraid to say anything about it. It's like, oh good, that's a wonderful position for us to be in, where people are afraid, they're afraid to speak their minds. What the hell? And it's not getting better. And if we don't do something about it, it's going to get a lot worse. You saw what happened at Berkeley. That's just a taste of what's to come. You know, one day there's going to be an anti-fast um, demonstration with a little bit of violence, and the bad guys on the other side are going to come out. And we're not going to like that very much. So maybe we should get our acts together and stop that from happening before it actually happens, unless that's what you want, and I wouldn't recommend it. We have a pretty sophisticated society, and it wouldn't take much to put a spanner into the spokes and flip everybody on their forehead. So, wake up, for Christ's sake. It's, this is not good. And the fact that, the fact that, you know, the bloody federal government has decided that they won't let people pick the judiciary anymore unless they take unconscious bias retraining. Right? What the hell? It's crazy. So, anyways, I'm curious. that's what happened. In addition to, you know, it's ideologically driven. Just to that, do you think, and I'm always quite cynical, do you think it's also a make-work project for a bunch of people that they figure, you know, we can create these tests that aren't valid, aren't reliable, but we've got an industry, you know, that, that's going to keep going forever now. Well, um, you'd never expect social psychologists to be careerists, would you? <laughs> Yes, yes, definitely. Well, I mean, it got out of hand, too. It's, it's not, you know, people don't necessarily plan these things. I'm sure that the Ontario Human Rights Commission, when they were talking about preferred pronoun use, had no idea whatsoever that, you know, within four years of introducing the policies, that there would be 71 different gender identity categories. No one saw that coming. How could you possibly see that coming? And I don't think Banerjee and Greenwald had any idea that their test would be transformed into an implemented public policy so rapidly. Right. So, okay.